Hello again, everybody. This is part three of your chapter 13 lecture series. This section is entitled Slave or Free? That is the question. The focus question for this section is why did the expansion of slavery become the most divisive political issue of the 1840s and 1850s? After the Mexican War, questions immediately arose about how to handle the issue of slavery and territories gained from Mexico. In 1846, Congressman David Wilmot proposed what has been called the Wilmot Proviso, which was essentially a proposition that put forth to ban slavery from all territory gained from Mexico. This essentially threw that old Missouri compromise out the window and of course greatly angered Southerners who greatly wanted to expand slavery into those territories. Also in this period saw the rise of the Free Soil Party, which were formed by opponents to the expansion of slavery. Now, the Free Soilers generally opposed expansion on economic and racial grounds. These were not abolitionists. They did not necessarily uh, think that slavery itself should be abolished, at least in the territories that it already existed. They opposed the expansion of slavery into new territories, essentially on the grounds to make these regions safe for free white labor that wouldn't have to compete with slavery in those territories. Democrats, for their part, countered with the idea of popular sovereignty, which was the idea that voters in each territory would vote to determine whether the territory would be slave or free. Again, something that threw that old Missouri compromise out the window. The appeal of the Free Soil position and the Free Soil Party was popular in the North, way more popular than abolition itself. The fear was the creation of new slave states would contribute to the Southern domination of the federal government, and westward mobility promised economic betterment for many Northerners, a promise that would be stifled by new plantations in those regions plantations that relied on slave labor. To white Southerners, on their, for their part, the Wilmot Proviso was a violation of their equal rights as members of the Union. By 1850, the debates over the expansion of slavery resulted in the Compromise of 1850. According to this compromise, California would enter as a free state, the slave trade would be abolished in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, there would be put in place a new, even more stringent, fugitive slave law, and there would be popular sovereignty in the remaining territories. There were powerful political voices, both for and against the Compromise, including a rising abolitionist voice that was completely against this idea, particularly the idea of popular sovereignty, which thus far had been untested and was unproven on whether that could actually work as a policy move in itself. Millard Fillmore, the gentleman you see here, was the new president in, at this time, and he helped secure the adoption of this compromise, which again was hoped to quell these tensions once and for all, but only served to fuel them even more. One of the clauses of the Compromise of 1850 that only served to fuel these tensions even more was the Fugitive Slave Issue. The Fugitive Slave Act allowed federal commissioners the ability to determine the fate of alleged fugitive slaves without a jury trial or even testimony from the accused themselves, and it prohibited local authorities, local governments, from interfering with the federal 
federal government's prosecution of the Fugitive Slave Act. And, most crucially to Northerners, it required individual citizens to assist with captures and actually made it illegal for Northerners to refuse to do so or face potential prosecution themselves. Of course, this was the part that most upset Northerners on this issue, who generally had wanted nothing to do with returning fugitive slaves to their southern masters. The Fugitive Slave Act affected all free states, and this act had the, the, the result uh, of also reinvigorating the Underground Railroad and inspiring new resistance from Northerners, and that resistance sometimes turned violent itself. The clash between pro- and anti-slavery expansion forces in this period came to a head once again with the issue of the organization of the Kansas and Nebraska territories. Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas introduced a bill to provide territorial governments in Kansas and Nebraska in part to support his idea of a transcontinental railroad. And Douglas adopted the idea of popular sovereignty in those territories, whereby the status of slavery would be determined by the vote of the local settlers. This resulted in the kansas Nebraska. Nebraska Act of 1854, which officially repealed that old Missouri Compromise. Of course, critics said that this would still extend slavery, and during the next few years, the Whig Party collapsed in the debates and the turmoil over this issue, and the South became solidly Democratic and the Republican Party arose out of the fall of that old Whig Party. That concludes part three of our chapter 13 lecture series. As always, study hard, and I'll see you soon.